everyone. Hello. Welcome. So it's the last talk of the day for this theater. <laughs> uh, how everyone enjoying Hope? Everyone having a good time? Great. That's great. I like the enthusiasm. So welcome to this talk. Uh, we're going to talk about payments. Um, so you pay for that. Payment surveillance, uh, sorry, payment systems, surveillance, and dissent. So please welcome Alex Martius. Hi, everyone, and thank you for sticking it out through to almost the end of hope. And I am hoping to make you feel even more hopeless by the end of this. So, yay! Um, I'm Alex Matthews. I'm the National Chair of Restore the Fourth. We do um, civil liberties work in the area of privacy and surveillance. And um, I've grown more and more interested in the topic of payment systems and government power and um, how that can be used to affect people's ability to transact and associate, and therefore their ability to dissent from whatever their government is pleased to think is the right opinions and the right practices. The immediate spur for, the, for this kind of thinking for me came in 2019 and related to a fairground ride. So my family and I were traveling in China and, um, for, and I had three kids who were very interested in riding on the fairground rides, and they could not. They could not because they could not use cash. And unlike at US fairgrounds, there was not a system of tokens where you could pay using a credit card or cash and then be given to coat tokens and then use them on the ride. Instead, the only payment mechanism that was viable for my kids to get on these rides that they really wanted to get on was to use WePay. WePay being a Chinese system that um, grew out of the social messaging app WeChat. And you cannot get a WeChat account without having a Chinese national ID, which, a matter that we thoroughly researched before going to China because we knew it would be kind of convenient to be able to use WePay. But there was literally no, well, there was literally no legal way that we could get a WeChat account. So our kids were fresh out of luck. And why is this convenient and, and good for the Chinese government? Well, frankly, there aren't that many tourists coming to um, China who have no access to anybody with a Chinese national ID. So the problem, from their perspective, is relatively small. And the benefits to the Chinese government of having a payment system that is anchored to social messaging in an integrated collection of apps is enormous from their perspective for all of the reasons from their perspective um, that the US government or other governments use when they're considering what kind of financial surveillance to conduct. The suppression of terrorism, the suppression of money laundering, the suppression of fraud, the su suppression of theft. These are all the same sort of familiar arguments. And so unfortunately, my family were not terrorists. Um, and, the, and a lot of the history of payment system surveillance traces back to efforts to suppress terrorism funding. So here, for, for, for many of you in the room, you already know some of this, but we're going to just briefly canter through some notable elements in the history of payments and surveillance. So the Patriot Act in 2001 establishes the new offense of material support for terrorism. It requires organizations that are transmitting money to foreign countries to certify that those they're sending money to are free of links to terrorism. Um, and the, it strengthens know your customer requirements and anti-money laundering requirements, all with the, all with the intent of trying to prevent the financing of terrorist attacks. Um, at the time, I was running a nonprofit that uh, sent substantial amounts of money abroad we wired money to schools in East Africa for the sponsorship of girls for their secondary education. 
So if we had been following the letter of what the Patriot Act required, then what we would have needed to do in each of the schools that we wired money to was to sit down with every employee of the school, every teacher, every other staff member, and to interview them to ascertain that the money that we were sending was not going to go to fund terrorist-related activities. And frankly, we were never going to do that because I love Sister Salome. She's an awesome person and definitely not a terrorist. And, ne and ju just for completeness, neither of the girls next to her are terrorists either. Um, but, you know, we were not going to be targeted in the same way for doing that because the Patriot Act's um, for financial surveillance requirements were not really targeted at GOES scholarship programs. So a well-known case during the 2000s was the Holy Land Foundation case. The Holy Land Foundation at the time of 9-11 was the largest Muslim charity in the US and it funded um, for, um, education and support programs in the Palestinian territories. At the time, the Gaza Strip was ruled as it is today by Hamas, and the US government rapidly after 9-11 initiated a prosecution for material support for terrorism on the Holy Land Foundation. Um, there was a trial, it ended with a mistrial with one of the jurors declaring publicly that links between, the alleged links between the Holy Land Foundation and Hamas had all the strength of a wet noodle. But there was another trial and the FBI got a conviction that they celebrate on their website to this day, um, which included senior Holy Land Foundation figures being sentenced to 65 years in prison. So yay FBI. Moving forward a few years, we have, yes, mo mo uh, mo moving beyond the sphere of Islamic terrorism to other activities disfavored by the US government. And after the publication of over 200,000 US diplomatic cables, WikiLeaks was blockaded for donations by PayPal, MasterCard, and Visa roughly simultaneously. The se a senior executive of PayPal on the, an earnings call explained that this was because the State Department had told them to do that. The State Department weighed in very, very rapidly and said that they had never asked them to do any such thing, and they maintain that position to this day. MasterCard li lifted their blockade in 2012. I'm not sure when or whether um, pay PayPal or Visa lifted their blockade, but here we see the dynamic starting, which we're going to see in other nonprofit groups during this talk, of um, WikiLeaks turning to cryptocurrency donations to sustain their operations. And that is something that they still do today in major parts to fund the defense of Julian Assange. Um, during the 2010s, we also saw the de development of um, f crowdfunding sites, um, most famously GoFundMe, um, but also its right-wing alternative, Give, Send, Go. And um, f there was an, and the, these, these sites are relatively easily subject to disruption by nation states because they use the regular banking system. Um, and Give, Send, Go ran into trouble with the Canadian government because it was a major vehicle for donations to the Canadian trucker protests against COVID restrictions last year. Um, and the Canadian courts weighed in to block the movement of the money, and there were also prosecutions of individual donors. Um, you can see, for those who have a little familiarity with the Fourth Amendment, that a lot of these third, third party fundraising sites raise the issue of the third party doctrine. This is the doctrine whereby um, the US government can approach entities with whom you share your data and can subpoena them or, um, or get a warrant for access to their data 
and you yourself do not necessarily b get informed and are not necessarily part of the process. It's all like you're considered to have exposed your data to the third party vendor's use and then, and then it's a matter between the third party vendor and the government. The third party doctrine is a little bit weaker now than it was 10 years ago, but it's still a very live element facilitating the US government's collection of data. We also have, um, during the latter part of the 2010s, the um, development of using blockchain to develop peer-to-peer -peer transactions outside the regular banking system that are not necessarily anonymous by design, but this whole ecosystem with the, with the fancy name of DeFi for decentralized finance evolving to try to provide people with alternatives that have lower transaction fees, that are faster, that enable people to move money around internationally with more convenience. And that then generates regulatory issues that the US government is really only beginning to grapple with. Um, we also have evolution of the SWIFT system. The SWIFT system has been around since 1973. And originally it was set up by a consortium of six Western banks, um, really just as a standardized messaging system for the settlement of international transactions. So, um, they, so they have standardized codes for banks. It makes it e a lot easier to transmit money, a lot less burdensome. Um, and SWIFT has become a dominant player offering a variety of services. And as it became dominant, it became more useful for governments to use to accomplish their foreign policy goals. So in 2012, you see the EU, EU um, enforcing sanctions on Iran by, um, for, by cutting off Iranian access to SWIFT. And this year, you see the US enforcing sanctions on Russia by cutting off access to SWIFT. There's a, clearly a little bit of institutional anxiety on the part of those administering the SWIFT system because there are pains to point out on their website that they consider themselves to be a neutral system and to be a utility, but they are also subject to these kinds of manipulation for foreign policy goals of nation states. So we can see that in the context of digitization, in the context of vastly increased um, flows of international funds, the government's greed for financial data is only growing. And the and as part of that, the neutrality of payment systems is under threat. Governments want to control the flow of payments and they want to understand the nature of payments. And in my, in my view, largely mistakenly, we are retreating from the idea that these payment systems could be used neutrally for anything that is not sort of massively criminal. Um, to um, to a situation where payment systems are more manipulable. As a response, we can, we can see the US government becoming more aggressive in the area of cryptocurrency tracking and regulation. Um, over the last few years, I think it's fair to say that the US government has become the most sophisticated actor in the world in terms of tracking transactions, unraveling mixers, um, tracing um, cryptocurrency transactions, obviously more easily with Bitcoin than with more privacy-oriented coins. Um, and there's also been a lot more thinking about how to integrate cryptocurrencies into the worldwide financial system rather than having them exist apart from them. And there's clearly a great deal of regulatory dis discomfort with that separate existence. Um, to explain a little bit about mixers, because not everyone here is going to be terribly familiar with what they do, but if you take 
Bitcoin is the default because it was the first cryptocurrency. Then user A sends a Bitcoin to user B. That tra transaction is recorded. It's on the public blockchain. It's visible. Um, if you use a mixer service, then that mix mixes your cryptocurrency pay payment with cryptocurrency from other users and sends that mix to one or more addresses that are designated by user A. That mixing process breaks the on-chain link between wallet addresses, and that improves user privacy and autonomy. The mixer then gives back to user A or onward to user B an equivalent value of the resulting mix of coins. So user A or user B, they don't have to know the source of their new assortment of coins, just that it has the equivalent value of what was put in, subtracting presumably some fee for the use of the mixing service. So the US government has begun prosecution of peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency traders for not fulfilling KYC re requirements, not filing these suspicious activity reports that you're supposed to file for transactions over, ten, over value of over $10,000. The first prosecution for that was in 2019. And they have also um, f started to contract with third party vendors who specialize in cryptocurrency training, uh, tracing, of which a big tra player is Chainalysis. Um, and the kinds of things that Chainalysis do are this. So when you have coins from two or more addresses that are spent in a single transaction, then it, the software reveals that whoever created that multi-input transaction must have control of both spender addresses. So that now allows Chainalysis to identify a single identity governing those transactions and to identify that to their client. In other cases, they can follow what's called appeal chains. So Bitcoins or other cryptocurrencies get moved out of one address, a fraction is paid to a recipient, then the remainder is returned to a spender at a different address, a change address. And Chainalysis's software enables them to distinguish the chain ad change addresses, and that allows investigators to follow a sum of money as it hops from one address to the next. So FBI is d developing significant expertise in this, so is the IRS, and so is ICE. Um, and they seem to have been starting to have substantial contracts with Chainalysis and a developing relationship with Coinbase to track tri cryptocurrency transactions, which I presume are related to them attempting to suppress cryptocurrency payments to coyotes smuggling people over the border. So the Biden administration attempted to introduce a rule last year that would not require reporting of all transactions over a value of $10,000, but over a value of $600, which would be a lot more intrusive. And we were working on um, congressional advocacy to oppose that move. Um, in the end, the Senate Finance Committee nixed it. Um, and what followed was an executive order with some really interesting phraseology for how they're thinking about, um, for, about cryptocurrency and payment surveillance more broadly. So I'm just going to read a little bit of that. They say, the executive order says, digital assets may pose significant illicit finance risks including money laundering, cybercrime, and ransomware, narcotics and human trafficking, and terrorism and proliferation financing, assumedly nuclear proliferation. Digital assets may also be used as a tool to circumvent United States and foreign financial sanctions regimes and other tools and authorities, and we'll talk about sanctions in a moment. Growth in decentralized financial ecosystems, this is the DeFi stuff, peer-to-peer -peer payment activity and obscured blockchain ledgers without controls to mitigate illicit finance could also present additional market and national security risks in the future. And they're right. Opinions differ on how much of a problem that is, but they are right. 
They're now contemplating the um, urgent adoption of a central bank digital currency, which is another way of co-opting the cryptocurrency space and bringing it into the mainstream. A lot of this comes, I think, from talking with staffers from the kind of impulse that I saw commonly with people when I was at public policy school. For public policy people, they detest the idea of biased and prejudiced decision making. And the conception, at least when I was at policy school, was that the way that you avoided bias in decision making was to collect more data. And that therefore, implicitly, more collection of data by the government by improving decision making is by default a good. And it's very hard for public policy people to wrap their minds often around situations where the collection of less data may be a good. That's just not how pub public policy courses and philosophy is structured. So we have data now flowing from cryptocurrency exchanges to FinCEN and from FinCEN, FinCEN outward to ICE and FBI and IRS. And this, I, I want to emphasize, this has gotten a lot deeper and a lot, a lot more sophisticated in between, say, 2017 and now, to the extent that even with the impressive progress that there has been on privacy coins like Monero and Zcash, in the context of this heightened scrutiny, relying only on the technology of those privacy coins feels unwise, especially for implementations that the US government may perceive as being against its interests, whether those implementations are legal or illegal in a given country. So this raises an interesting question for, uh, um, for of whether cryptocurrency can, in fact, blunt the impact of sanctions regi regimes. And with that, how much can it blunt the, Im the efforts of the US to advance its national interests? We're getting into some very large questions here. And you can see the anxiety about that in the executive order. So how far is that really true as we stand? Well, what I see realistically right now is that implementations outside the US that are citizen focused are blunting the impact of sanctions on individuals. That's not exactly where the anxiety lies, but that, it, but that is nevertheless the case. So there are some useful examples of this. Um, in Venezuela, for people who have been looking to flee Venezuela in the context of the currency controls that the Venezuelan government imposed, cryptocurrency has been a useful store of value, enabling them to flee the country and still take something with them. In Afghanistan, with the acute crisis that is going on there, um, there are educational charities that are reported to be turning to cryptocurrency so that they can continue to provide some measure of girls' education without using anything that is visible to the Taliban, but also without having to raise funds in ways that go through the mainstream banking system, which is operating under sanctions, and also as things get more desperate there, to provide famine relief as well as education. I've seen reports that um, Iranian students are using cryptocurrency to um, be able to pay college tuition for remote learning courses, um, which would otherwise come under sanctions. A, the feminist coalition in Nigeria got blocked from raising funds by the government um, because it advocated too energetically against police brutality in Nigeria. And they have been using cryptocurrency to continue their work against police brutality and against impunity from rape. Um, and another interesting example I found was the Belarus Solidarity Foundation, which is an association of dissidents against um, the Belarusian dictator Lukashenko. Um, again, blocked from raising funds by their government. 
They've used cryptocurrency and continue to use cri cryptocurrency to fund that descent and also now to fund volunteers and medical supplies and equipments and in the form of arms to resist the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So let's think about the larger anxiety in this executive order. Why is it that we have not seen, as a consequence of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, a substantial turn by the Russian government to using either cryptocurrency more broadly or privacy coins in particular to evade sanction regimes? There are a few reasons why that might be so. So one is probably that this whole Ukrainian invasion was envisioned as being a short-term over by Christmas kind of thing. It was, in, I think, envisioned as an easy security operation and that the conquest of Ukraine would be brief. And that logically means that they would not necessarily have been thinking about long-term financial retooling of the tools that they were using. There's obviously issues of expertise. I would be surprised if a substantial portion of Russian leadership were familiar with the use of privacy coins. Um, but there are also issues of scale. Wars are massively expensive. And the daily transaction volume on Monero, which is the largest of the privacy coins by some way, um, is a tiny fraction of the expenses of a war. So we would be able to see um, a Russian-caused expansion in the use of privacy coins that just is not there. And that issue of volume suggests that the anxiety in the executive order that nation states would use privacy coins and cryptocurrency to blunt the impact of sanctions. That really is not happening yet and is not going to happen until adoption of privacy coins is a lot broader than it is today. Um, so, there you go, there, there is good and bad. So, now comes the, the part of the talk where I get to be a little bit of a Nostradamus and to give a plausible scenario for near term, the near term future for payment system surveillance. And there are some things that are reasonably foreseeable, some of which are already in part happening. So in the context of privacy coins, um, De some degree of deplatforming from exchange exchanges has already happened. And in some countries, there will be attempts to cr criminalize the use of privacy coin related software. Um, we can expect to see more countries experimenting like India has done and like China has done and like Sweden has done with discouraging the use of cash. Cash is too flexible and too anonymous for the default assumptions of governments these days. An enormous amount of the world's payments transactions are still conducted in cash. Even in the US, it's still around 50%. Um, and we can expect to see that continue to decrease in an environment of government discouragement of cash. One thing that... Um, it gives privacy and surveillance activists hives is the prospect of increased mergers between credit rating agencies and data brokers and open source intelligence c providers. A vastly increased volume of data going into credit rating decisions, whether that data is of high quality or low quality. And forming what you might call credit broker entities um, that pose a significant threat to people's privacy in the payments context. On another axis, we can see that Facebook already spent a couple of years trying to create its own cryptocurrency lumen. Um, 
and was clearly prompted in that by the success of the WeChat, WePay app um, access in China. And we can, t we can expect to see continued efforts along those lines. And in, and in the West, it may be that, that eventually those efforts will be successful. So if those consolidations occur, then we can reasonably foresee that governments will have an enormously strong incentive to coordinate with credit brokers and WeChat analogs to do all the things that they already do with other types of surveillance data. Heat mapping of where the risky entities are, flagging those entities, harassing those entities, prosecuting those entities. And some of the, those prosecutions will be completely legitimate. Some of the concerns relating to payment surveillance are completely legitimate. But there's also going to be a lot of fallout for individuals, privacy, um, that comes along with that. Um, for, uh, and it is hard to see what institutional or legal barriers there may be within the U.S. context that would prevent the U.S. government from going down that particular path. So then we can then I can switch because it is my talk and I get to do this kind of thing from being Nostradamus to being Moses and making not the commandments, but some suggestions of things that we can do that may help a little bit. I'm not sure really what will help very much. These are powerful forces that are involved here. But one element of this can be that the, the smaller banks and the credit unions in the US are not geared up with the SWIFT system. And so for folks who are privacy conscious, there can be small banks and credit unions that may be preferable to large ones. We use one called Digital Federal Credit Union. Um, the privacy coin adoption and volume problem, solving that would solve a large number of other problems. It would solve problems of volatility. It would solve problems of how you get ca resources out of the privacy coin context and into contexts where normal people transact um, in ways that may be less transparent to, the, to governments than the regular banking system is. There's been a great deal of research that there isn't really time to get into in the cryptocurrency space over um, identity solutions and, ha and what is sometimes called sovereign identity, but um, having instead of a unified digital, digital identity, um, separate identity claims in separate contexts that by balkanizing your digital identity, enhance your privacy vis-a-vis -vis the government. There have been long running experiments with autonomous currencies. There's one near me in Massachusetts, which is Berkshires, which has been um, popular for a long time in a particular county in Massachusetts. And that's a local physical currency. Um, for for um, anarchist groups, um, there have been interesting experiments on a smaller scale with you know, black market work and barter economies and free cycling and mutual aid that exist, existed and have always existed um, outside of the regular banking system. And one thing that might be useful and interesting for you, for you folks as a takeaway from this is to practice setting up an unhosted privacy coin wallet while it's legal to do so and to try transacting with it and see, see where it takes you and what kind of implications that generates in your mind for this kind of problem and how it may be solved. So those are the preliminary thoughts that I have for you on the topic of payment surveillance. I think it's a really fascinating area and that it's going to become something that um, as activists we have to think about more and devote more time and thought to. But I'm going to open it up at this point for Q&A, and thank you for being patient and for listening.
So if you want to come to the uh, mic over in that direction, then I'd welcome any thoughts that you have. This is, this is, this is You're first. Okay. You're up. It's you. <laughs> Thank you for an awesome, super informative talk. Um, I had a question about the slide you put up about uh, the contracts with, uh, uh, with, with, with ICE and with the government, right? So Coinbase and Coinalysis and a few other folks. Uh, yes. Is that dollars or is that thousands of dollars? Because those numbers look smaller than I would have expected. Mm. Um, and my understanding is that those are thousands of dollars. So I, sh I should have made that clear. Okay, so these are billions, not yes. mil Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes more I'm sense. sorry. They're, they're, I can feel my math teacher cringing <laughs> at me for not labeling axes properly. But there you go. Thank you very much. Yes, please. How are you doing? I met you yesterday at yes. your booth. Um, so what you're saying is uh, if the government start uh, banning the privacy coins, of course they're going to force the exchanges to remove the coins from their, from their systems, right? The, so what, what happens? What do you think is going to happen? Is it just going to go to like decentralized exchanges at that point? Or, I mean, they could continue going on. It's just going to get harder for probably regular people to understand how to trade. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a process, I think, where governments are expecting that there is going to be 0% usage of privacy coins in the future. But I think it's something that they want to discourage and denormalize and drive out of anything that is at all analogous to something that is usable. Um, and so, the, um, it's an awkward discussion, and I've been in some of these discussions, and you have folks who understand the potential of privacy coins who are saying, you know, look, you don't understand. It's not about trying to regulate this particular kind of coin or this particular kind of software because it is designed to make you irrelevant. Um, and, on, and on the other side, you have a lot of interest from governments in the potential that cryptocurrency poses as long as it can be adequately taxed and monitored. Um, the um, and I think both elements of, of of these folks are right in the in a way, but you can have very innovative software that is very privacy friendly that still nobody with, will use if governments decide to just make it illegal within their spaces of government. Then that will discourage people. If it is perceived as being something that is on, that only criminals will use, then it will discourage people from using it. Um, and so, there, there 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 are a lot of things that governments, I think, will be willing to do to maintain their grip over how people transact and to make that continually more transparent to them. This is a very important thing to governments to do. I think most of us here um, believe in the individual's right to privacy, but the sad truth of a lot of um, anonymous currencies, you know, I don't want to name any, is that they are used disproportionately by bad actors. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, you know, in your p various positions, how, how do you counter this argument? Well, so I think that speaking a little bit to the dynamic I was just describing, um, the more that, um, f that governments try to repress and discipline a particular technology, the more it will be likely to be used only by people who have, let's say, a really strong financial incentive to keep their affa affairs out of government eyes. Um, I've given some very favorable examples of people who might have good reason to use privacy coins. Um, but it is nonetheless true that there are um, child sexual abuse materials that are circulated using these payments. There is money laundering that happens. There is tax evasion that happens using these tools. But at present, I would have to say that 
at least as regards tax evasion and money laundering, an enormous volume of that occurs through the regular banking system. And it occurs because you have corrupt individuals who are working within banks who enable it to happen on behalf of wealthy clients. And so I, I understand the need for there to be some notion of knowing your customer. I understand the impulse behind it, but I also see a much more ardent desire by governments to squash these particular technologies than to clean house in the established right. banking system. They're, they're easy targets now. Since, yes. You know, it's, it's nascent. And I think they feel like they've done all they can in the fiat side of things. I'm sure they do feel that, or at least they feel they have done all that, that they are willing to do. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, I'll tr keep myself to one question. Um, the, so we do have nowadays a lot of um, people, a lot of consumers who have moved away from cash, um, and um, the, um, even though cash has a lot of benefits for personal freedom, they, um, they um, adopt the corporate run system, um, payment systems that are um, some, sometimes credit cards, sometimes um, I use like them Apple. Too. Yeah, right. So a lot of people use them, um, and um, data brokers and so on have a lot of visibility to what happens in them. Um, so I'd, um, you'd expect that to result in costs to consumers, although consumers are usually not aware of the costs. Um, mm -hmm. It seems to me that we are seeing those costs, um, but it's being attributed to anything but um, the recent adoption of, of um, these corporate surveillance um, payment systems. Um, so, uh, I mean, everybody's suffering with inflation. Nobody connects that to the rise of corporate, uh, um, corporate surveillance payment systems. Um, I wonder if you see any link there. So, um, I do not feel qualified to speak on the link between inflation and these phenomena. I am not a trained economist. Um, but I would, I would say that it is true that it is hard to see the damage from, um, fr from poor privacy practices and poor information security practices, and that it can be shocking for people to come from other countries to the US and see just the regular process of credit card transactions and go, like, this is crazy. You're not entering a PIN, you're not there, you're, nobody's checking a signature, the, the, nobody is checking that the person who has the card is actually that person. This is an apparatus that is designed absolutely for the convenience of the merchants and very little um, to do with protecting the consumer against credit card fraud. So people have great reasons to be skeptical of the current ways that we handle things. Um, <clears throat> you laid out very nicely that uh, cryptocurrencies don't play a role in sanction bustings for, let's say, Russia or for China or for Iran as a state actor. Why is it then, and then cryptocurrencies are used, as you showed, with great success for people subverting um, other states. Why is it then that the U.S. has such a hard on, let's say, uh, to actually regulate cryptocurrencies when they're actually being used very successful for, let's say, uh, liberal uses instead of suppressive uses? I think, I think that there is a, a real tension of world views that I can encounter in these spaces. And when you're talking to like staffers on the Finance Committee in Congress or, 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 f or folks like this, then it is about there, be there being data that is out there that they are g can gather that they are not gathering. It is about there being problems that they could potentially solve if they, if they allow the government to gather this information 
that they are feeling like they cannot solve adequately without that. Um, and so it is a worry about their scope of authority um, that I think it, it is so, such a powerful and fundamental thing for folks who have this kind of training that they might not even articulate it. And I don't know even if I would have come to articulate it if I hadn't wended my way over into the privacy and surveillance space. Um, so um, for, I don't think that there is much that will stop governmental employees from feeling that there is a problem here in the development of the cryptocurrency space. It's often the case, honestly, that government departments are victims of ransomware attacks that are executed with the aid of cryptocurrency technology. Um, and that often is because government departments are poorly protected and have risible information security practices. Um, and, and so they're, they're, they are ripe for the plucking. Um, but that doesn't mean they like the sen sensation of being plucked. I think your question is, I'm sorry to interrupt, but in the U.S., I think the government have a lot of pressure from the banks, which is controlled by Federal Reserve, to crack down on this stuff because in the long run, cryptocurrencies are a threat to the U.S. dollar. That's why I think personally mm -hmm. I this pressure, not too much about that. Yeah, on your Moses slide, you mentioned sovereign identity. Mm. Um, are there any concrete examples of that? Uh, well, there is. Um, you can look up um, the one that I looked into most closely are some folks called the Sovereign Foundation, S-O-V-R-I-N. And they, they've been doing a lot of thinking about the how you deal with what I characterize as the problem of blockchain and identity persistence. Because, in a sense, we, we all benefit from a certain plasticity in our identities, being able to shift our self-conceptions over time, being able to shift ways that we name ourselves and describe ourselves to the world, and not having a fully accurate digital record of the decisions that we have made. Um, the, one of the risks in the blockchain space is because of the indelible nature of transactions on the blockchain, if there are solutions adopted unwisely um, that are blockchain solutions that, um, that fix a particular digital identity at a particular point in time, for a person, then that person will be accountable to that identity for as long as that blockchain is accessible. I've seen some absolutely cracked suggestions of applying blockchain solutions in the criminal justice space in the US. And I'm like, for Christ's sake, don't touch the one with the other. They should stay very, very far away from one another. Um, so my hope is that if there are methods evolved for, as I put it, balkanizing your digital identity and having it break up into particular claims in particular contexts, then it will decrease the risk to people's self-characterization of the existence of blockchain technology. And I'm sorry if that got a little abstruse and hypothetical, but that's been on my mind. Okay, looks like we're done. Hello. Hi guys. So just to let you know, uh, closing ceremonies will happen on 416, but also there will be broadcasts here as far as I know, correct? No? no? Okay. 216? Yeah. Okay, so t uh, yeah, 206, I think. 
206 or 416, those are the places to go to watch the closing ceremonies. Thank you.